Oh, hello. Hi there. How you doing? It's yourself. I just wanted to pop in before the episode starts just to say a couple of little things. So, in this episode, I'm going to be talking, well, a pretty grisly story. A very, very, very crazy, crazy tale, which we will get to. Um, One of the big major themes that runs through it is religion. And I just wanted to be very clear about something before we even begin. I'm not mocking the religious part of the story, but it is a huge, huge factor. And some of the behaviour is crazy. Not the religion is crazy, but the behaviour attached by some of the people in the story is crazy. So before we start to get into people going... Oh, you're anti this, or you hate this. I don't. Well, it's not. You know that. If you've listened to me, that's not my style. It's not my vibe. I'm not going to hate on anything. But I do, in this episode, talk about religion. um, And a very specific one at that. So, I just wanted to say that straight away. It saves me having to do it throughout the episode. When you know that's not me, you know that's not what I'll do. Also, Swedish people. You are in for a treat here with me trying to pronounce some (laughs) Swedish terms. Uh, And also, Shouty Man is on holiday this week. Okay, good luck everyone. I was programmed to kill. He told me what to do. I was listening to God. And then she arrived. She was the first. And there would be a second, and a third, and a fourth to arrive into this little town. Agents of chaos, we called them. This town would never be the same again. She was programmed to kill She was told what to do and she was listening to God. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. Okay. (laughs) This story. I've got one word. Palava. (laughs) It is a palava of a story. It's an absolute mess. Not my telling of it. Just the story. I mean, I, I would not be judging you if at you, points you were like, I need to get a pen and paper and start to write down what the hell is going on. This is how I had to do it, honestly. I mean, I, genuinely, when I first looked at the story, and when I was first uh, introduced to it, which I'll get onto in a second, I went, oh, brilliant, that's totally... Totally, the style for Extraordinary Stories is brilliant, it's great, I really want to tell it, I'm really invested in it. And then, every article that I found, it, there's so much information was coming at it, that I was like, eh, hang on, I'm going to really need to break this down. So, there was a long process of just trying to establish, what the hell is the timeline? Where is everybody in this story? And I think I've done it. I think I've cracked it, which is good. So... I think you're going to like this one because it's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely bonkers. So just before we get to the absolute palaver that is this story, 
I'm just going to do some quick shout outs. Okay, sh the first shout out has to go to Asa Halstrom for sending me this story in the first place and for providing me loads of brilliant and wonderful information to get me started on it and I am so, so grateful. Beck Lee on Facebook. Hello. Thank you, Beck, for the love. Lovely to hear from you. Jeffrey and Nicole Rhodes. You sexy husband and wife. Hello. Hello, Jeffrey. Hello, Nicole. I hope that you are great. Tina Waldron. Now, Tina. It's a bit late and I'm sorry, but it was Tina's birthday and she turned 30 years old on the 20th of January and I'm sorry that this show is a few days after your birthday, but I, yeah, I hope that you appreciate that. Um, I'm going to sing happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday. Dear Tina, happy birthday to you. Okay, so great. 30 years old, great, have a great time. I mean, I'm only 21, so I've no idea what 30 might even feel like. Oof. Okay, hello to Carl Phillips. Hello, Carl. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Thanks for being a supporter. Do you know what's up? Interesting, Carl, is every time I read your name, right, Carl Phillips, I always see it and I always think, it sounds like the name of, like, a designer, doesn't it? it sounds like, and again, she was walking down the red carpet and she was wearing Carl Phillips. Or it's like, the new fragrance by Carl Phillips. I don't know, Carl, maybe you are a secret designer, I don't know, but hello. Alison Alexander. Hey girl, <laughs> that was me trying to do American <laughs> and be like, sort of sorority American. I think I just made myself sound like a drag queen. Um, hello Alison, hello. And lastly, Stephanie Weaver. Hello, Stephanie, I'm sending you my love. Thank you for being a big part of the Facebook community. I do have one more to say, actually, and it's um, it's not just one person, it's two people, and it's a podcast that I've banged on about before, and that I have much love in my heart for, and it's the Bloody Murder podcast, Bloody Meta podcast, with Tara and Barney, it's, I mean, it's, it's incredible, it's great, but what's fucking fantastic news for them is that they have been signed to the Acast podcast network and I am so delighted for them because they so deserve it. It's a brilliant podcast and they have worked their arses off to to get to the point where a podcast network wants to sign them and I can completely understand why that's happened and I'm really, I'm so, so happy for them. So, well done. They're going to be mega famous, those two. Honestly, they're going to end up, I don't know where. They're going to, do you know what? They're going to become the new Minogues of uh, Australia. That's who they are going to become. I mean, who's Kylie? Who's Danny in that situation? I don't know. That's a discussion for a whole other day. But anyway, well done to Bloody Murder for their success. I'm really happy for them. Right, this story. It's... A beast. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. Let's start with where we are. We're in Sweden. And it's 2004. When all of the events that I'm going to describe eventually reach a massive climax. Now we're in a place called Nutby. That's an immediate, I'm just going to say it, that's an immediate error. Because I think in Sweden you call it 
can it be, can, can it be, something like this, right, but I, it, when, it, when it's written down it looks like not be, so I'm just going to call it not be. This is how not be gets described. A community in the middle of the forest, four miles east of Uppsala, where the centre itself is not much more than an intersection with a shop, a school, a pub and a church. Just under 1,000 people living there. So it's this little, like, quite tiny little self-contained place. Not many people know about Nutby, but <laughs> after the events that take place, Nutby will become very, very well-known. <laughs> A in Sweden, but also worldwide. So picture this little serene community. It works, right? It just works as a little place. It is what it is. It's lovely. People are going about their lives, just doing the things that they do. It's got its church. It's got its one little pub. You know, it's a happy, functioning community. And there are four people who are going to enter into this town and they're going to change that forever. The four people are the individuals that I'm going to take you through now. And how their arrival had such a massive impact on that little Swedish town. Let's, right, first of all, let's talk about what the religion is in Nutby. So I said it had a church. It does. And in that church, the main religion is Pentecostalism. So I had to do a bit of work here because I was like, I don't really know that I know what Pentecostalism is. And I found lots of different things. I found things saying that it's a form of Christianity that emphasises the work of the Holy Spirit as the direct experience of the presence of God in the believer. And this is something that I really was like, ah, I think I get it now. I think I understand it. It's to do with this idea that you experience God in your life. And it's not that you are just someone who passively sits back and prays to God. It's that actually you believe God exists in your life and you find ways to bring God into your everyday in life. I think it's I think it's about not I think it's about believing in direct communication on a daily basis not just through prayer but through direct contact. Now of course the big question there is how how are you doing that then? But that's something that becomes very important later in the story about how people are actually connecting with God in a way that is direct and having an impact on them on a daily basis but that's kind of what I can understand the philosophy of it to be. So there's a church in Nutby called the Nutby Philadelphia and it's a really small but very very active congregation. It's got a real big massive age range in it it's got sort of, you know, your older congregation who've been there for a long, long time, who follow this faith. But it's got quite a few on the other end of the spectrum who are quite young. And all the time it's gathering more and more people who are interested in the congregation. A lot of young people are becoming attracted to it. They're becoming attracted to this faith and this church. There's over... I think 200 young people who are a part of this church. Now, the way that it works is this. It has small teams of congregations and they are led by team leaders. And you can go to these team leaders at any point for spiritual help. They're sort of, you know, you're like... But, well, what's the best way to put it? Essentially, they're your, like, line manager, if you will, 
right? That's who you would go to if you were having a sort of spiritual crisis or you needed some guidance. Now, above them, you have the pastors. And the pastors are the... What's the phrase I'm looking for? Top, top of the tree? Is that the right way to say it? Top of the tree... Yeah, they 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 they're the they're the big guys. They're the big people in charge of it, right at the top. Okay, so you've got your pastors, and then you've got your sort of team leaders, essentially line managers, and then you've just got your con. Let's introduce the first person that we need to know about, and that is Osa Waldu. Osa is a very dedicated follower. Of the Pentecostal religion and its teaching. Now, for a long time she's been teaching in other churches elsewhere in Sweden. She doesn't know Nutby at this point. That's not even on her radar. She's off in other bits of Sweden and her job specifically becomes about trying to get younger and younger people interested in the religion, interested in the church. So it basically means that she goes out and I think what she does is she sets up lots of little like groups here and there and sometimes they're small, just three, four people at a time and she gets these to build and she draws people in, she draws young people in to these groups and she teaches them about the Pentecostal re religion and what your relationship with Jesus should be like and she's very good at it. That's the thing, she's actually excellent at her job. Now, Osa hits a bit of a problem when she gets herself into an inappropriate relationship with a teenage boy. She's in her late 20s and she ends up in a sexual relationship with a boy who's 15. Mm. So... When the town that she's in, in Sweden at that time, realise this is what's happened, they, well, basically force her out of the town. They ask her to leave. She's asked to leave the church. She's asked to not run any of her groups anymore. She has to go because of this scandal. Fair enough. I think that's absolutely valid. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> would you <laughs> let that <laughs> behaviour exist? I know you would not. Osa is now in a position where she has to find somewhere else to be, somewhere else to live, and somewhere else to preach. And she settles on Nutby. So she arrives there. She gets somewhere to live. And very, 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 very quickly, she becomes a part of the community. She becomes a part of the church. But more than that, she becomes a big, big presence. She is really a very, very dominant, dominant person. And she will make herself known to everyone. She will make her presence known. And she will get right in about that congregation. I mean, she does not hang about in terms of getting into that congregation and letting everyone know that she's arrived in town. She sets up all these different groups for trying to get teenagers in. Well, it's not great with your past history, but okay. She wants to get, you know, younger people coming through. And it doesn't take long. It really doesn't take long. But she rises very quickly to the ranks of pastor within the Nutby Church. The only ever female that they've ever had be a pastor. Of the women who went dependent, throw your hands up at me. That must have been what she was hearing in her head at the time. She was like, oh my God, I'm so Beyonce at this moment. Look at me. <laughs> I'm the female pastor. So, when she has that position... Her sermons include things like the consequence of sin is death always. She will really ruffle feathers in the community as 
she's quite dramatic. Right, she's quite dramatic. <laughs> she's quite big. Sorry, I'm laughing there because dramatic is a word that I often hear about my own behaviour. But um, anyway, yeah, we'll just move on from that. <laughs> so, yeah, she's causing a bit of a stir, essentially. And some of the kind of like older members of the congregation are like, I'm not sure about this person. She's really coming in here. She's trying to shake it up. And how she's trying to shake it up is what she's doing is she's trying to get more and more young people involved. She wants it to be bigger. So she's kind of looking at the congregation and she's going, well, this is fine, but it's full of lots of people who've been here for a long time. I want new blood coming through the door. And she's just quite a bit controversial, I think, in some of her sermons. You know, she's happy to talk about sex really openly. And I think it shakes people sometimes. They're not necessarily ready to hear it. But the other flip side of that is that some of her sermons are actually the busiest. The, she sort of ends up becoming really, really popular out of it. And people start to really listen to what she's got to say about what a relationship with God means and how close you should be to God all the time. You should always be searching for that closeness to God and you should be trying to bring God into your daily life, have a relationship. This is not about just praying from a distance. This is about a relationship. And people start to go, yeah, great, okay. I think this chick knows what she's talking about. So, you know, they start to sort of pay attention to what she's got to say. Now, <laughs> what Osa does next is, I mean, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant and it's crazy. And it, again, I'm not taking the piss out of it. I'm just like, what? Just hear it and just make your own decision. She holds a ceremony in which she becomes engaged to Jesus. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how that works. How the hell does that even work? But she does it. So, the event is sort of like a wedding. It's attended by hundreds of people and she becomes engaged to Jesus. She then will begin to call herself the Bride of Christ. Right then. Okay. Fine. Um, yeah, I'm just... <laughs> I'm just imagining what... What it must be like. Like, if you're living in that town, right? You're living in the town of Nutby. Just imagine what it must be like and you're having a sort of casual conversation <laughs> someone you bump into in the street and you're like, oh, hiya. Yeah, well... Oh, God. I'm going to Osa's wedding next week. I'm really excited. So I bought myself a new dress. I'm getting my hair done. It's going to be fabulous. Oh, lovely. Who's she marrying? Um, Jesus. Actually, she's marrying Jesus. Mm, great. Okay. <laughs> Here's another complication. She's already married. She's actually already married to a, a an actual man, like a human man. <laughs> she's married to this man. And that's got to be awkward. That's got to be awkward for him. To be like, um, uh, yeah, actually we're married. Oh, but now you're married to Jesus. And you're now calling yourself the Bride of Christ. Oh well, okay. Fine. So, that's her. That's uh, the Bride of Christ. That's how she is deciding to operate her life. Which, you know, you know... You, you do you. You do your own thing. Don't, don't, haters going to hate. Don't let people judge and all that jazz. <laughs> but some of her, like, beliefs, some of her religious stuff that she comes out with, it's... I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a bit contradictory in terms of... She sort of presents as this, like, I'm very, I'm very independent. I'm very much full of, like, you know women should take charge and we need more female leaders in the world. But then often her sermons will say things like, it's the role of a woman to obey 
her husband. And she needs to ask her husband's permission. Even for the small things. Even if you want to go shopping, a small shopping trip, you must ask your husband first. I feel like there's a big disconnect between this idea of her being independent and actually what she's preaching is that women need to be subservient. I have massive issues with that. Huge, huge issues with that. But ultimately, the Bride of Christ's main belief is that one day she is going to be taken from this earth and she's going to be united with her spiritual groom, Jesus. That's the Bride of Christ. And she is really important in this story. And so now that that's kind of set the scene, I've got the vibe, what's going on there, let's move on to character and number two, the second person who's going to enter Nut B as an absolute agent of chaos. A man called Helg Fosmo. I'm just going to call him Fosmo. All right, that's how we will know him. Right, so who was he? Well, he was a man who he yet didn't live in Nutby. He's going to get there, but he doesn't live there yet. He lives in another part of Sweden with his wife and his three kids. And he has a really deep interest in the Pentecostalism religion and the teachings. And in the village that he lives in, he works kind of part-time as a pastor. Now, his sermons can be quite fiery. <laughs> He's known for his quite outrageous opinions. He says... <laughs> I, mean, I can't even say this without laughing because it's just so stupid. He says, Women must stop being manly feminists. <laughs> and there is only a man on earth. Your man. <laughs> He's basically saying women are here to serve men. Great. Okay, brilliant. It, as part of another sermon, he talks about... <laughs> a woman should not be a stick in bed. She should give her husband what he wants. And she will be blessed. <laughs> All right, Fosmo. Maybe want to um, <laughs> change up those ideas, yeah? Maybe want to... Be a little bit less uh, misogynistic. That would be, that would be great. But he's not going to be. I'm just going to warn you right now. He's not about to change his values. Those are just his awful opinions of how women should be treated. And uh, yeah, that's him. So he's about 27 years old, and his wife Helen is about the same age. What's really interesting about Fosmo and how he gets described is that he's described as charming and chilling all at the same time. What a way to be described. Chilling and charming. I mean, it's basically saying <laughs> he's really nice, but he's a massive dick. I mean, that that is essentially what you're saying about him. And we're going to learn... He is just a massive dick. So he is really, really keen to move to Nutby because he's heard really great things about the church and about what is going on there. His wife, Helen, not so keen. She doesn't really want to leave the little Swedish town that they live in. She's like, I'm quite happy here. And he's like, look, babe, you've got to do this for me. The wife must obey. And she's like, look, I don't want to move the kids. I like where we live. But eventually she gives in and they move. They move to Nutby and they get a house close to the church. And within <laughs> days, and I mean days of being in Nutby, who does Fosmo meet and befriend? Who's going to become his closest friend in that new place? It is, of course, 
the bride of Christ. Asa. Now the two of them, they get on like a house on fire. They both share the same beliefs. They both feel really strongly about Jesus, about the connection that you must have with Jesus in your life. And it takes only a week, just a week, but Fosmo is appointed a pastor in Nutby. And they start to spend a lot of time together. A lot of time together. And they get together and what they do is they do a lot of reading of the Bible. They share a lot of ideas. They talk about how they're going to present themselves in their sermons. What are they going to say? What's the message that they want to spread to the congregation? But (laughs) they don't spend all their time praying. If you know what I mean. (laughs) If you know what I'm saying. (laughs) They had begun an affair. Now this is... (laughs) If you're out there and you're having an affair and you're listening to this podcast, take note, right? (laughs) Because this this might be a really good get out clause for you. They're having an affair and they justify it by saying, we are doing God's work. This is what God wanted. Eh? (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) I don't think so. For two people who teach the Bible, I think you need to read it a little bit closer. Yeah, absolute pair of roasters. Anyway, they're having this affair, they're shagging away, and it doesn't remain a secret for very long. Pretty soon, most of the congregation know what's going on. And they say, look, we are going to stop. We're going to stop this affair. It's just, it's been been a moment of madness. But also, it's kind of been what God wanted. So we're not really in the wrong. Now, Fosmo's poor wife, Helen, she's been dragged to a place that she didn't really want to live in. She's got three kids and her husband starts having an affair with the Bride of Christ. (laughs) I mean, what? (sighs) I mean, looking at it, what makes it even worse is that Osa is actually married to a man, like a human man, right? And she's married, apparently, to Jesus. And Fosmo is married to Helen, and yet this affair is happening. I mean, it's just, it's it's, it's very fucked up. It's, It's not right. It's like a soap opera, isn't it? It's like, oh my God, it's it's total soap opera vibes. It's like, oh my God, do you know that Betty from down the road is having an affair with George, whose uncle was once his auntie, and now his cousin is involved. Blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah. It's the reason I don't watch soap operas and all that. Well, I don't have the time. I also don't have the attention span to keep up with who is shagging who. So... Alright, I'm going to introduce the third person that we need to know who's going to descend upon Nutby. Alexandra. Alexandra has not long graduated from university. She had done a business degree from one of the major Swedish universities. And... Like I said, she's going to be the next person to enter Nutby. And why? Well, two reasons. One, she is deeply devoted to the church and to Pentecostalism. And so she wants to go to Nutby because that church is amazing. People are hearing about it and they're going, wow, it's great. It's absolutely amazing. But secondly, and maybe most importantly, her older sister lives in Nutby and she wants to move there to be a bit closer to her. Okay, who is her older sister? It is, of course, the Bride of Christ. Yes, the Bride of Christ is her big sister. And so, when... Alexandra arrives in the community, she is welcomed with 
open arms. And here she is. She's this fresh-faced, 20... What's going on with my voice? Why is my voice doing a weird breaking thing? <laughs> I think my voice is breaking. <clears throat> oh, it's my age. It's my youth. Um, yeah, she's this, like, fresh-faced, 20-year-old. She's new in town. And here she is. Now, who do you think? Who do you think might take an immediate liking to the very attractive Alexandra. Well, Fosmo, of course. Not only has he been having an affair with her big sister, the Bride of Christ, but he set his sights very firmly and very quickly on Alexandra. Man, this guy, seriously, he cannot keep it in his pants he is he's a sex pest <laughs> he's actually just a sex pest that's that that's what i'm calling him pastor sex pest <laughs> oh my god how <laughs> how good would it be as a band name <clears throat> pastor sex pest and the bride of christ i mean that's right out of the punk era isn't it why was it a punk band never called that that's brilliant <laughs> So, Alexandra settles into the community and she gets to know people. You know, her sister's there. It's great. She becomes a part of the church. She becomes a part of the congregation. And from a distance, Fosmo is harbouring a deep, deep passion for her. It's around this time that Fosmo... And the Bride of Christ start having conversations along these lines. Bride of Christ. Do you ever dream that your wife is dead? Fosmo, yes. Often. I can see her dead in my dreams. She is dead in a bathtub. Bride of Christ says, And do you think that's a sign from God? Do you think this means anything? And he says, yes. Yes, I do. I believe I'm being sent a message. Just a month after they have this conversation, tragedy will strike the Fosmo family. Helen, who never wanted to live there and has had such a hard time raising three kids, is found dead. Guess where? In a bathtub. In the Fosmo home. Now the scene is treated immediately. Helen in the bathtub dead is treated immediately as a crime scene and suspicious. But the toxicology reports will show that in her blood she has a large amount of... Right, now bear with me. Dex... <laughs> Dextra... Profit... <clears throat> Dextraprofafine. Nailed it. <laughs> Basically, it's a painkiller. It's an opioid that... Well, it gets it gets used to treat lots of different things like aches and pains, headaches, sore muscles. I think it's like a sort of cocodamol, like a sort of codeine type thing. And it doesn't take an awful lot of it to overdose on it. And that is what the report will say that has happened. That she had overdosed on too much of it and died in the bath. Here's what's very fucking weird. There is a hole found in Helen's skull while she's dead in the bath. But it doesn't seem to bother police too much. It doesn't really seem to cause them too much hassle. Because the hole in the skull is never really gets reported properly. What the fuck? 
That's so odd. Yeah, there might have been high levels of cocodamol or whatever that drug is in her body, but it's a basic it's a basic over the counter painkiller. I'd be more concerned about the fucking hole in her skull. I I would be more worried about that. But police, no. They're gonna say the official ruling is accidental death. Hmm. Okay. What does this do for Fosmo? What does this do for him now? Well, it basically frees him up to chase his desires. And his desire is Alexandra. That's what he really, really wants. His wife is dead and buried. He's got his three kids, young, young kids, to think about. But what he really wants is Alexandra. So more conversations begin to happen between him and... And Ossa, the Bride of Christ. She says, Since your wife's death, who have you dreamed of? He says, Alexandra. He says, I've dreamed of her and she, in my dreams, is my wife. The Bride of Christ says, I absolutely believe this. My younger sister shall be your wife. It is God's will. It is what God wants. Hmm. The problem here is, right, there's, well, there's two things. There's two sort of major problems. A, has anybody checked in this situation how Alexandra feels about the situation? I mean, I'm sure for Fosmo, that's not even really a consideration. He's like, well, I don't really care. I'll I'll just get whatever I want. But, yeah, has anybody actually checked in with her to see how she's feeling about this? Uh, No, they haven't. Um, And secondly, the other big problem is she's actually engaged to someone else. Yeah. Since Alexandra had come to the town, she'd actually met someone else. But that's not going to stop Fosmo. It's not going to stop him. Especially now, I mean, he's having conversations, for goodness sakes, with the Bride of Christ about this. So, this is what he does. I just find this unbelievable. He goes to Alexandra's fiancé and he says to him, God has told me through my dreams that Alexandra is to be my wife. And the fiancé says... I don't think so. I Well, I don't think so, mate. I love her. That's why we're engaged. We're going to be married. Fosmo says, yeah, that's all well and good, right? That's all well and good, but God has essentially ordered me to make Alexandra my wife. And so this is what has to happen. How would you feel as that fiancé? You would want to pretty much punch him straight in the face is what I'm thinking you would want to do but just like what what so while that conversation has happened and there's a little bit of time a little bit of rest he's back to getting sermons Fosmo is back to his pastor ways and when he's giving his sermons he's talking about death as saying it's not to be looked at as a sad thing. It's not to be thought of as something that we should feel bad about. It's coming home to Jesus. It's a person who longed for their home in heaven and they have found that home. If you die, he says, this is Fosmo's beliefs, if you die, it's not the worst thing that can happen. It's the best thing that can happen. And he gets overly excited when he's teaching these things where he's like saying, it's not a bad thing to die. You're going home to Jesus. Three months after his wife has died in the bathtub, Fosmo marries Alexandra. Now, I worked this out a little bit here, right? And I thought, do you know what? (laughs) You know what that makes now? Am I right in this? Yeah, I am right. 
That makes the bride of Christ his sister-in-law. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because he's married Alexandra and her sister is the bride of Christ. So you then, yeah, that's his sister-in-law. Creepy. Creepy as fuck. You've had, um, <laughs> you've had an affair with your sister-in-law and you have... I'm going to say essentially forced Alexandra, her younger sister, to marry you. Great. Okay. So, Alexandra moves in to the Fosmo home and they begin their lives together. So, he's still giving all these sermons and he's still being a pastor. And Alexandra, she also has a job and she's also still very, very involved in the church and in the Nutsby community. All right. Okay. So hopefully that is all pretty clear so far. Yeah, we've got Bride of Christ. Oh, we've got Fosmo. And we've got Alexandra. Okay. That's our three players at the moment. Now, the fourth and the final player is about to enter Nutsby as the final agent of chaos and complete this crazy, crazy story. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> Thank you.